Can we bless the, the Lord's name for our worship one more time and glorify Him? Show us your glory. Wow. That was powerful. I'm so excited about being here with you all at Coastal today. And you noticed as you came in when you sat down, there was a little white card sitting. If you'll all get those and have them in your hand just for a minute, I want to explain what we're going to be doing with these in just a little while. Uh, I'm going to ask for full participation. I, I don't know if you've ever studied the Great Awakenings, when God really began to move in the lives of the church, when uh, He began to set a fire ablaze. I've already heard that term this morning in prayer with some of the, the men of this church. But when God began to do a greater work, let me tell you one of the things that was absolutely key, and it's what God's called Terry and I to in the latter uh, part of our ministry, and it's calling people to a public moment of renewal and repentance and revival. So let me tell you what I've been doing all over the country since 2000, probably in about five. I've been using these little three by five cards. And here's what I'm going to invite you to do this morning. If you had any idea how much God loves you this morning, if you and I had any concept, on, you do know, of course, you're the apple of his eye and you're the object of his affection. If he had a refrigerator, your face would be on it with a picture. Now, I'm telling you, it's true. That's the way he feels about you. If he had a billfold, your photograph would be in it. He absolutely loves you. And if you knew how much he loved you, and we've sung about that, then why would we want to carry around anything between us and him? And he wants to unburden us this morning. That's why he sends Terry and I around. Uh, we're traveling all over now. All over. We're crisscrossing this country. And I'm doing the very same thing every time. I'm looking people in the eye and saying, you're a bunch of sinners. <laughs> Isn't that encouraging this morning? Here's the truth. When you got saved, Jesus washed all your sins away. Do you believe that or not? But here's the reality. I, I wish I could say I've remained uh, uh, with all my sins gone. The truth is... I find myself sometimes with weights and sins, some motives that aren't there that really should not be in my life. And they're hindering my prayer life. They're hindering my devotional life. They're hindering uh, my witness and the opportunities and the dreams God has over me. So here's what we're going to do. And by the way, I've already written two things on mine. You say, Pastor Tom, do you, how do you do that when you go every week somewhere different? I'm a sinner. That's, that's why. I'm a mess. Here's the difference, though. I'm an honest mess. And I'm asking you to be honest this morning. So get your card close by. And it might be a pious one or two in the room and say, well, I don't need that. I, I don't have any sins or weights. Let me tell you what we're going to do in the invitation. It's so freeing. We're going to walk down this aisle. And we're going to take these and we're going to present them to God. And here's what we're going to say to him. Lord, I love you more than I love my sin. I love you more than I love that person that I'm having a hard time forgiving. And I'm choosing to lay that before you. There may be somebody in this room, I feel there probably is, that's never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to write in your card. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And I want you to not only write it on, there's two things I want you to do. I want you to see one of our pastors or come and see me so that I can tell you this happens all the time. But this will give you an opportunity public while other people are responding to unburden yourself. That's how much God loves you this morning. And by the way, we were singing all about it. Show us your glory. Let every heart be holy, be holy ground. You ever wondered why God can't give us everything he wants to give and bless us every way he wants to? I'll tell you why. Because of sin. You know what the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit promises to do? And this is, I'm claiming this this morning. The Bible says the Holy Spirit makes this statement. I will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Let me tell you what I cannot do. I cannot convict you, nor will I try. I'm not pointing a finger at you because I have to stay before God and be sensitive about him right now. And by the way, I'm blessed to see a few of you already jotting down a few things. Hey, we know our heart. Well, I say we do. Then that scripture jumps in my head, Pastor. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Remember the next part? Who can know it? Do I really know my heart? Listen, this is the morning where we say to God, Lord, do you have something to show me that maybe it's been years but I haven't been aware of, and you are holy. And I want my heart to be holy. So show us your glory. You know what's holding the glory back in our churches? You know what's holding the glory? You know what the glory of God is? It's the essential, it's the essential presence of God in all of his splendor as he reveals himself to man. It's when God shows up. And the preacher can't preach, and the singers can't sing. 2019, Lord, let me hurry now because it's, it's got, there's 30 minutes counting down. It's rolling down. It's moving on me. 
And there's another service coming. In 2019, before I stepped away from serving Central Baptist in Dunn, North Carolina, and I met some folks that, that uh, have been there and know me, and so that's encouraging. But before I stepped away, I said, Lord, I sure would love to see us have a real revival. I mean, a gully-watching, old-time, hallelujah, devil-hating, Jesus-loving revival. I mean, it just break loose. And Lord, there's a bunch of people in here who want the same thing that I've been wanting. And watch this. And so we began to pray, and the Lord opened the door for me to be introduced to a ministry. I've heard about it for years. It's called Life Action. Life Action Ministries came rolling in. And I know every church couldn't do this. Your church could, other churches, but smaller churches couldn't do this. But they brought 40 people with them. They came in on, on buses. They came in on semi-trucks. They set everything up. They did the worship, worship team. They did the worship. They did the children's, we had children's events going on. Kids would come in and worship with their parents and they'd go back into there. And it was all about revival. We had student events, Aaron. God was moving all over that church. For the first three, three or four services, they just preached on honesty and humility. Didn't even give an invitation. But on Tuesday, when they gave an invitation, there was so much conviction in that room. This is some of what we did. We confessed our sin. And Greg, I'm going to tell you, God moved in an unusual, supernatural way. I'd look up there every now and then when God was moving, and that whole worship team would be on their face before God in the church. Let me tell you what, what I'm hungry for, and I believe you're hungry for. It's beyond what man can do to see what God can do in this church and in this city. Yes. Now, in this, in, with that in mind... I want you to be honest. Would you be honest this morning? I mean, if anywhere we ought to be honest, it ought to be in the gathering of God's people. And I've already been honest and written some things down. And I've got my pen out. And I'm, I have been known to bring the Holy Spirit convict me right while I'm preaching. And if he does it, I'm writing it down. But I want to preach this morning. If you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15 on this subject, the joy of God. The joy of God. What makes God joy? I'm so happy to be here. Greg and Suzanne, thank you <clears throat> for loving me uh, as I got a little older and a little chubbier. And even when I'm not pastoring a church, thanks for believing in us and praying over us and celebrating with us this season in our lives. And I can't tell you how proud we are of you. You've had strong integrity. I've watched you for 30 years. I've observed the hand of the Lord on your life, though I never would have dreamed. I'll be honest, my faith wasn't as big as yours. All of what God has done and the influence he's given to you and this great team and this church, I just rejoice and I can't wait to watch what God will do in the future. Thanks for giving us a little part, giving us a little opportunity to be a part in the early days so we can clip some coupons on y'all as you keep on moving into the future. And if, and then maybe later years it, when things go even stronger, you still have an old man that will come in and say, hey, take your Bibles. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe on a Thursday or something when you don't have anything else going on around here. Well, notice in your Bibles, Luke 15, and before we do it, I, I, just, I just want to rejoice in the goodness of God over us and how much he loves us. <clears throat> Lord, I want to tell them that. My time's getting short, but you remember that? I'll just do it quick. You want to know how much you mean to God? This is a love letter I receive from him every day. And it started when I was sitting in the back of a car in Chicago, Illinois, and I was listening to these preachers. I was to, pre I was to preach that week in the conference, and they had a bunch of missionaries there. And one of the missionaries said he had just been in the conference and heard this truth. Everybody knows this. Repeat it after me. It's the statement that God the Father made over Jesus at the baptism. At the baptism. Uh, remember, remember what happened. Listen to this. As John the Baptist was baptizing, and the Father shows up, and he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I never saw it before. But boy, when I saw it that day, I got my pencil out and wrote it. Tears began to stream. And those two guys from who knows where sitting in the front seat didn't know, have no idea what was happening to me back there. But I was having a Holy Ghost moment. Because here's what happened. I could hear what God was saying. That man was saying in a men's conference, you ought to say these three things that the greatest father said to his children. And you ought to say them to your children every day. And I took the thing away further than that. Here's the three things. Number one, I love you. This is my beloved son. He said to Jesus that day, I love you. Number two, I'm here with you. Out of everywhere in the cosmos, he showed right up. I love you. I'm here with you. Number three, in whom I'm well pleased, I'm proud of you. Now, I was thinking about my kids, and I can't wait to text them, and I'm, I'm going to tell them all three of those things. And then all of a sudden, the Lord whispered in my heart, you're in Christ, Tom Wagner. Well, Lord, have mercy. What do you mean by that? You're in Christ. Well, that's the way God the Father feels about you. 
Beloved, now are you the sons of God. So now every morning when I pray, I say, Lord, you got something to say to me? Because I want to hear it. I love you, Tom. I'm here with you. I'm proud of you. You don't have to be afraid to walk in to a bunch of people you don't know. You stand up in me because I love you and I'm here with you and I'm proud of you. That's the way he feels about you. So tomorrow when you pray or today, would you just say to him, Lord, remind me of what that, that little chubby guy said that came to our church. <laughs> Remind me of what he said because I'm so thankful this morning that I can stand in grace and say to you, I'm a favored son of the Most High God. And that's the way he feels about you, daughters, and that's the way he feels about us. In this text, I want to preach for a few minutes on the joy of God. I noticed something. I only have time to refer to the first two parables in this uh, scene. As the Lord's preaching, he, he, uh, he, he lifts from it himself this parable, first of all, of the sheep. And then of the silver, and I noticed something <clears throat> for the first time. Look at what happens after he gets the sheep, puts it on his shoulders. Look at verse 5. The Bible says, and when he had found that sheep that had gone astray, he left it on his shoulders. The next word in my translation is rejoicing. Yours is something similar to that, if it's not that. Look at verse 6. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me. And then I love this statement in verse 7. I say unto you that likewise... <clears throat> joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. You know, we always think, well, that means people getting saved. Did you know there's joy in heaven when the believers get right too? Because then God can flow through them the way he wants to. But it wasn't just in the scene with the sheep. Look what happens with this woman. And what is it with women and money? But look right there. There it is in the text. The Bible says there's silver there and they're sweeping it up. And they find that little coin. And she finds it, and when she finds it, look at what she says. She calls her neighbors together in verse uh, 8, and she says, Rejoice with me, I've found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. Boy, I'm starting to get a, a, a picture here. And before I move into the last story, the last true story, the last event that has happened in so many lives, though this is a parable, this has happened so many times, and even in my own life. My brother, my older brother, lived down the road in Holly Ridge. My brother was 60 years old. He wouldn't have anything to do with God or the gospel. He was 60 when he died. A year before he died, my mother's prayers. Thank God for mother's prayers. My mother's prayers. He could not walk over those prayers and go to hell. He just couldn't. She just kept praying. We kept praying, crying out to God. <clears throat> I was in the voting booth in the large metropolis of Dunn, North Carolina, casting my vote. And while I was, the phone rang, and it was, tell you how old it, long it's been ago, it was a flip phone. <laughs> Don't laugh. I got people in Dunn still carry flip phones. That's reality. Two or three in here. Like, What's he talking about? Well, you got a flip phone too. He, I answered the phone. My brother said, how come it works for some people and not for others? And the Holy Ghost said, he's under conviction. I said, you're under conviction. I don't know that I am. I said, oh, you are, and I'm coming down there. I picked up a couple guys from our church that had been down the same road my brother had with drugs and alcohol in prison. And we got in the car and we prayed all the way down there. We cried and we acted like we were believing God to do something. When I get there, my brother's laying prostrate on the floor, crying out to God. And he repents and gives his heart to Jesus. We didn't even know a year later he was going to die. The Lord let us see this scene played out. And you've seen it time and again. Notice in your Bibles, verse 11. And I want to preach on the joy of God. There's joy in this story too. The Bible says a certain man had two sons. <clears throat> and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, <clears throat> his younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with reckless or riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. He didn't count on that. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him in the fields to feed swine. That's not a big deal for us in Sampson County. In fact, that's an honor right there. We're hog producers, buddy. But a Jewish boy, there could not have been anything more sad for him to be asked to do and more embarrassing. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk or the pods that the pigs did eat. No man gave him. What a mess he was in. I want you to see, number one, this morning, the sinful younger son. The sinful younger son. And the reason I want you to see it is because I've been him before. I've been him since I became a son of the Most High God. You say, what do you mean, Brother Tom? Well, there have been times when I've not been what I ought to be. There have been times where sin has found its way into my life. And I wasn't honest about it. I could have sat in a church just like this 
and let a sermon be preached or let the man of God preach in the series he's preaching through the book of Mark on Jesus and never be moved about my sin. Feel like I'm doing okay. I'm giving a little money and I'm going through the motions without the glory. Remember what it used to feel like in the presence of God. I was trying to imagine what that father was thinking. I remember a day when that younger son used to come running in the mornings and grab me around the leg and say, Daddy, can I go to the fields with you? And maybe he, he would go and sit on his father's lap. I don't know. But I know there was a day when he was the apple of his father's eye and he loved him so much. But on this particular day, he does something that nobody could even imagine. He comes to his father and he says, I want my money. Here's what he, John MacArthur said. He was basically saying, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. I hate you. I hate this life. I don't want to be here anymore. And I saw some sins in the life of the younger son. Do you have your pen ready? Do you have your uh, piece of paper? Let me give you some of those sins. And if the Spirit of God speaks to your heart, I encourage you to be honest. Number one, neglect. He just neglected his father. Coldness. He just, the things weren't where they should be. I see rebellion in his life. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I just don't want to wait. I just don't want to do it. And discontent. Do you see that? He's disrespectful. That's another sin in his life. He's greedy. This is the most blessed culture. You probably have more than your parents have. I, I, I see greed in him. I just can't wait. Impatience. Selfishness. Boy, that one was one I struggled with and I still have to bring before God on a regular basis. I want my way. How about this one? Excesses. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine. Where is excess? Whatever the excess is. And what about, he just wanted to be more than who he was. He, he wanted to be somebody. He, he was the sinful younger son. How about this? The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. The pride of life. Pride is the sin through which all other sins flow. Sexual sin would later follow him to the far country. Drunkenness and laziness and irresponsibility. It's, in, it's interesting when I preach this text, people say, Pastor, some of the things you didn't even mention, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about. Yes, it is. He will always speak to us about those things standing between us because he points us to Christ. Kyle Alderman wrote in his book, Gods at War, that there are three primary idols in this culture. They are money, power, and sex. Nothing wrong with either of those three. They're all important. But when a good thing, listen to this, when a good thing becomes a God thing, then it's an idol. And nothing is to be bigger. Nothing is to be more important than our relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you believe that or not? And I believe he also had a fear. For a while he stayed in that hog pen and there was a fear. The sin is fear to return. But can I give you the greatest sin? The greatest sin in the life of this younger brother? You ready for it? He just didn't love his daddy like he ought to. If he would have loved his father, he would never have said the things he did to him. He would never have asked him to sell the land that had been in his family for decades he would never have shamed his father in the town that he lived in like he did. He just didn't love him the way he should. Vance Havner, an old man of God that traveled these North Carolina roads through the years and all over the country, said that revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. I don't know how you feel about it, but I want to love him so much that when they sing a song about him, I want to have a tear in my eye. I want there to be a snap in my step and joy in my soul because I love him better than I do anybody else. Now, I love Terry to pieces. We've been married 44 years. I have a children. I have, a, I don't know, I'm sure how many of them, but I got eight grandchildren and I love them. And I love my daughter-in-law and I love my son-in-law and our three kids. I love a lot of people, but I don't want to love anybody like I love him. And the great sin I see here in this young boy is he just didn't love his father the way he should. But I want to move forward to that, that older prodigal son. Not only the sinful younger son, but number two, the self-righteous older son. I see this one in churches. I meet them about everywhere we go. 
And they like to tell you that they, uh, their parents gave the land for the church. <laughs> or I'm a deacon in this church. Well, whoop de doodle you know. <laughs> Who are you? Or I, uh, what I used to do and what I used to accomplish and how much money I got or anything else. Let me tell you something. Nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But if you're prideful about it, there's an issue here. This self-righteous older son, and I'll tell the rest of the fun part of the story in a minute. I always save the good part to last. But the Bible says in verse 25, the elder son was in the field. <clears throat> He's working. He's working for God. He's not so much worshiping him He's work, but for his daddy, but he's working for him. And, the, and he came and drew nigh, verse 25, to the house, <clears throat> heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What's going on around here? And he said unto him, your brother's come. Thy father has called the, uh, killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And instead of being happy, he was angry. And he would not go in. He came, his father. <laughs> Listen, I love this about the father in the story, which is Jesus. He not only comes out for the sinful younger son, he comes out for the self-righteous one. He comes out there and he says, he entreats him. He says, come in here with me. And he answering, verse 29, said to his father, Father, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time. That's a lie. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't perfect. Thy commandment. And, and yet thou never gavest me even a goat, a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. You see, sometimes I see myself as the sinful younger son, and other times I see myself as the self-righteous older son, if I'm honest. I'm trying to be honest this morning. Are you being honest? Can I show you some of the sins of that Self-righteous older brother. <clears throat> Number one, a lot of his sins were sins of the heart. They weren't ones you could see on the outside. But see, only you know of that person you just won't forgive. Mm -hmm. Or you, only you know about that anger or that wrath or that malice because you look good this morning. I want to look around, man. It's a good-looking bunch. They're all spiritual, Pastor. If I believed everything I saw, I'd think they're all sanctified, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Every one of them. <laughs> Here's what I know about you, though. I know the Bible says all of us are sinners. All of us. This old boy had been holding this in for so long. You know how much the Father loved him? He wanted to unburden him. He wanted to free him of that. Sins of the heart. Entitlement. This is a big one in this culture. Somehow we think, why me? Well, why not you? If we belong to God, everything we have is His. Everything we've ever gone through, He has allowed and guided. He may not have caused, <clears throat> use whatever terminology, but He is a sovereign God who's in control. Do you believe that? And God uses all things for His glory in the long run. And for our good, even though we don't understand it, we don't have to. He's God. This old boy not only had sins of the heart and entitlement, he lied. Sometimes we color the truth. Complaining. He's just whining. <clears throat> boy, I can't stand a whiner. And I've been a whiner. Can't stand myself sometimes. Complaining. Serving was so big to him. He just, he absolutely was all about the work. Now, why was he doing it? I'll tell you what, he, he wasn't doing it because he loved his father. You see that in the whole scene. He wanted approval. The approval God. Lord, do I have to tell him that? One of the sins on my card is, you see, when I walked in here this morning, I want Greg to be proud of me and Suzanne. I do. I want them to love me. I want you to. I don't know. I know <clears throat> I got issues. My father drank himself to death when I was 10 years old. I never got approval from a father, and I've been looking for it ever since, and about every man that's older than me, and some that are younger. But the approval God is a pride issue, and it's not pleasing to God. This old boy struggled with this. His self-righteousness was manifested in his hypocrisy, <clears throat> his resentment. He, listen, here's a big one. He judged you may not say it out loud, but in your heart, what in the world is she thinking? What is he doing? I don't know why they... Unforgiveness is a sin of this self-righteous older brother. 
He just couldn't forgive his own brother. You got anybody you can't forgive? You said, preacher, you don't know what they've done. Listen to me. There's a bunch of mean people in this world. You hear me? There's some aggravating people. I believe I could slap the fire out of them and the Lord would say, Amen! I believe it. I believe it. I've seen them come into church. I have. Wolves. I have. But listen to me. Here's what I found out after 38 years of pastoring the church. The Lord can take care of them. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to lead from a platform of fear. I keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. And I have not. I don't have any business holding unforgiveness. <clears throat> now, am I going to go take them out to supper tomorrow? The answer is a hard no on that. <laughs> I'm going to just tell you that. <laughs> I, I could tell stories here, but I'm not going to. No time. Nine minutes are left. Look at this. Not only unforgiveness and pride. Listen to the pride in this older brother, this self-righteous older prodigal. I'm better than him. I'm better than my little brother. No, you're not. No, you're not. It's only by the grace of God that you're sitting at the Coastal Community Baptist Church this morning. You don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be washed in the blood of the Lamb on your way to heaven with joy in your soul. You don't deserve it and I don't deserve it. But by the grace of God, we are here this morning with hope in our soul restored. Idolatry. Same in this older brother's life. Are you writing anything down? Is God speaking to you? Not me, but him. Are you writing down the God of me? You know what? When we boil it all down, though, let me hurry. Let me give you the primary sin in the life of the self-righteous older brother. You see, I would have loved to seen him come up and hear the music and the dancing. What's going on? Your brother's home. Oh, my goodness. Not so much he's happy with his brother. He took a third of the whole family wealth. But so much that he, daddy's going to be so happy. My daddy's been grieving every day. He's been standing out there watching every day that dusty road. But instead, he's angry. He's self-righteous. He's got the same primary sin that the little brother had. He just did not love his father the way he should. Neither one of these prodigals did. And I hate to tell you this, but there's a bunch of us that don't love him like we ought to either. If we did, things would flow out of us and it wouldn't be these sins. And when we sin, we have the advocate with the Father and we'd go running to him immediately. You know how when you sin, <clears throat> sometimes the Holy Spirit will convict you real quick. That's the moment right then. You don't wait until they gang up on you. That's the moment. And somebody, there's a self-righteous one in the room probably, I'm sure right now they're saying, that's what I do. I, I had a sin two weeks ago on Thursday, but I dealt with it right then. <laughs> yeah, sure you did. Look here, if I could look in your heart, and I can't, but God can. <clears throat> this morning, to walk out of here with, even, with anything, a motive, anything that's wrong, would grieve our Father. Now let me get to the happy part of the story. Don't you love it? I love happy ending to stories. True stories. I love Hallmark. Get, I do. They're getting a little crazy here lately. But I love Hallmark because always the boy gets the girl in the end. They walk off, have a wonderful life together. I'll never forget years and years ago when that movie Message in a Bottle came out. Remember that? Somebody said, Pastor Tom, you love love stories. You'll, you'll love Message in a Bottle. I could have killed somebody at the end of that movie just for recommending it. Because you know the scene. You know, he, 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 is the one he loved so long, she's died. And he's building this boat and he's going out for the first voyage on it. But he met someone and they're going to, it looks like they're going to fall in love and it's going to be a great ending. But instead, oh no. Oh, instead. He goes out, this family's in trouble. <clears throat> the boat's tossed. There's a storm. He's a master swimmer. He drives in to, dives in to save them. And they all die including him. It's the worst movie ending in all of history. Don't ever watch that movie. But when I, when I look at what happens to this boy, notice verse 17. And when he, the 
sinful younger son came to himself. He said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, I've sinned against heaven, not just you, daddy, but against God and before thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I'm going to have to paraphrase because my time's getting there. And the worship team's heading back to their spot. You ready for this? It would have been the most terrible thing in the world. Fathers weren't to go meet their sons in moments like this. The, the rule of the day was the son would come and would sit in the city square. And the father, according to my study, would wait until he was good and ready. And when he would go into town, he would flog him and beat him and shame him. But instead, the father was watching. And when he saw him coming, the Bible says, he ran after him and he embraced him. He fell on his neck. He began to kiss him. Does this sound like Jesus to anybody but me? Now he, the way he came running to us and embraced us and forgave us. And the word is he kissed him and he kissed him and he kissed him and he kissed him. And instead of the shame being on the boy, the father has the shift of shame. And he takes on the shame as he runs toward him. And he brings him home. And he kills the fatted calf. I want you to see thirdly the sacrificing Savior. Not only the sinful younger brother, the self-righteous older brother, but the sacrificing Savior. Oh my goodness. He's waiting to see, will we repent? Will we turn? Will we come to God and believe when we walk down this aisle in a moment or two and drop these cards right here along the top part of this platform area? When we drop them there, will we do so believing that the, get ready, here's a good place for an amen, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. I mean, will we, will we have enough faith to lay hold on the promises of God and will we turn from them? When we ask God, Lord, not only forgive me, give me grace every day to not walk down through that path again. And when we do, we come back to Him in repentance. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Our worship team's preparing. I want to encourage you, look, if it was just you and me and Jesus in this room, what's He asking of me, Pastor Tom? Hey, I'm a guest. It doesn't matter. You're important to God. In a moment, I want you to come. And just stand here for a moment. Drop it here. You can turn and walk back to your seat. You can remain here in prayer. Whatever you feel led to do. But I'm going to ask you to publicly respond. Basically, you'll be saying, I'm a sinner. Just like all my brothers and sisters that are here. But I'm a forgiven sinner. And I don't want anything between me and God. Father, it is in the name of your son, Jesus. Your holy and righteous and perfect son that I ask you in these few moments there's going to be all kind of battles going on Lord to some sins that we've been in a, a cycle with for, through the years that the enemy's fighting but thank you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds Lord he has no power here I pray every spirit but the Holy Spirit will be removed and that you oh God would allow us to come and humbly repent today. Lord, may we leave here with more joy. And Lord, what's great about it, I didn't even say it, is you will be having joy. It, joy, it brings joy to you, Father, when your people are clean. So help us this morning, God. We listen for you. We repent before you. We humble ourselves before you. We're not doing this for anybody else. We're just doing it for you. Because we love you more than we love our sin. Lord, forgive us. Wash us and we'll be whiter than snow. Thank you. You said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Do it, Jesus. Do it, Holy Ghost. All for you, Father. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Our, he our heads are still bowed, but let's stand. I wonder who'd like to lead the way. Just obey God. Come on. Just obey the Lord while they, while they lead us in worship.